Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steve Clark, and welcome to Brooklands. As ever, thank you for being here, and thank you for supporting the Trust. Um, many of you may know that this will be my fifth year of organising and hosting these talks. Some of you who have been around or managed to keep up with us for that long will know that my very first guest was Steve Parrish. Uh, we've come a long way since those early days, and I just want to take the opportunity to thank him because about 90% of the motorcycle legends that we've been here have been here um, have been possible because of Steve's work. So <laughs> go, go and get yourself another drink. I think it's the best idea. Um, every time I've spoken to Steve over these five years, there's one name that kept cropping up, and I said, you know, we really ought to get this guy. Uh, here at Brooklands to entertain us because I don't know about you, but I used to really enjoy the banter between these two guys. Even if it was the worst race in the world, they would make it fun. So I think we're about to address that tonight. Hold on to your seats. You never know what's going to happen. Please welcome Steve Parrish and Charlie Cox. <laughs> All right. Oh, dear me. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Steve. And uh, it's been a pleasure all the years I've been coming here. Uh, and I don't remember how many there are. In fact, it's going to be quite interesting tonight because neither Charlie or I remember anything that we kind of ever really did. We just sort of remember the things that we got into trouble for. We're just here to apologise. Yeah, yeah. Because <coughs> um, there will there'll be someone here. There will be. As long as there's no one here from the British Broadcasting Corporation. That, uh, or, you, or indeed the World Council of... Motor racing, uh, mo uh, motor renters. Motor car renters, yeah. Now, I think we should just clear that up in the first instance. Um, I asked Charlie some years ago to come along, and he was busy, 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 and then finally we got him along. But I'm just going to just... Uh, probably a lot of you might know more about him than I do. I first met Charlie Cox uh -oh. after uh, I started working for BBC, and I had a co-commenter called Lee Diffie. He cleared off to uh, America, and Charlie was working for BBC covering touring cars, correct? That's right. But Chief the Foreign reason Labor. you were working for them, because you raced in them. And the main reason I knew your name, because I saw a picture of you going through a grandstand at Thruxton. Is that yeah, right? I didn't have a ticket. They, they wouldn't let me back in. Wouldn't they? What, because you hadn't got your pass? I didn't have my pass with me. And, and talk us through that. Was it, was it uh, obviously something on the track or brake failure? It couldn't have been your disability to... No, no, no. No, I, no, I just followed everybody else as I was wont to do. No, I had a, I had a brake failure. And I, it was amazing because I got through church. And you're so relieved of getting through church on lap one. You think everything's going to be OK. I uh, hit the brakes. There weren't any, or not many. Right. So I just started rolling and rolling, and I went through the grandstands, and I, woke, I was knocked out. And when I came to, they had all those roadworks there behind the grandstand next to the A303. Right. And I'm up like that, and there's all these mounds of dirt everywhere, and I thought, God, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> Heaven's not supposed to look like the moon. <laughs> and all all I could see was just a, a, broken, spe uh, a broken taco and mounds of dirt. Right. And I thought, thought I was pre buried That was heaven. I don't think you're going to be going there. No, I'm I've not. known you a long time. I'm pretty sure you're going down. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... Um, anyway, so that sort of... Uh, you packed up car racing because you kind of banged your nut, not and yeah. nogging and bits and pieces and so on and so on. And the first time we went racing together, I got on the plane. Uh, we were going to Valencia. And I was reading Autosport, and he looked at me and said, you won't be fucking needing that where we're going. And that was it. Autosport was, it was, it was motorcycle news. That, that was that. it, yeah. So you were, you were given a motorcycle news, and you had to follow it all the way yeah. through. And there were, in fairness, there were a lot of people. What's he know about bleeding motor bike races? Well, nothing, plainly. Well, no, no, no. Well, neither of us did, quite frankly. We just sort of... <laughs> it made the commentary good, though, because we were so ignorant. We were constantly surprised. Yeah. Wow! Yeah, yeah, we yeah, exactly. Yeah. Didn't really have a... And we had some good commentating kind of helpers and assistants and everything else over the years. Where People who knew things, Steve. Some of them uh, actually, uh, in fact, I'm going to tell a bit of a story here, and, and I really rate the lady now, but it was Jenny Gow, wasn't it, that came along on one occasion? Yeah. And um, I think she was she good. was the one that asked you where reverse was, wasn't it? On a yeah, that, yeah, yes. We, uh, no, she said, I was trying to explain to her how, the, how single cylinders would work, and she could, single cylinders, that, that That'll never. Her first, her debut was actually in Qatar, which was the first round of the season, and 
she, um, it just went terribly wrong for her in every way. Mm. And it was one of the, you had one of these as well. She suddenly realised she didn't know what to say or where to go. So she just crouched down like that, thinking she was off camera. She wasn't. Camera was getting it from about there. <laughs> and she just waddled off the stage like that. And we got, you know, poor old Jen, I didn't realise I was going <laughs> to bag her. So anyway, we got to about round five at, at uh, Le Mans. And you know, at the, at the end of any practice, they all mill out down the back of the circuit somewhere and have a practice start. So he, it's in the time when he's sprinting down to do the live pit lane chat with us, so she and I are ad-libbing, and the first thing she says is when they all stop to do what they've done every single race for the last, I don't know how many hundred years. Practice starts, yeah. What are they doing? What's happening? Are they on strike? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, she, she had a good year. Yeah, she got it all together again, and she does a great job for BBC Radio yeah, now on, does, on yeah. Formula One and everything else. Now, um, I am going to apologise for our immaturity, and it probably, Charlie, in fairness, it isn't your fault, and I never really understood for the 10 years that we covered MotoGP why I was always the driver of the hire cars, and I think it's probably because you didn't want to get into trouble with the hire car companies or the police or the BBC, for that matter, because you were only an accomplice as opposed to yeah. being part of the action. Well, what, what happened was it turned out that it didn't take the BBC long to work out that the minimising the damage was best if you put us in the same car. So at least we couldn't race each other quite as much. And the first time we went to pick up a car, it turns out you had a, you had a worldwide ban from Alamo Rent-A-Car mm. over that. Un you remember the Dukes of Hazard? He thought it was a really good idea uh, at Daytona to see if you could actually do the thing and land on the beach. Yeah. And he did, but what he failed to factor in was, as the car landed, it all sort of folded in like that. So you had to get in and out of the so, electric yeah, windows you, after that the, anyway. I don't, I don't know much about the Dukes of Hazard, but do you think they, they must have stiffened the chassis on their cars, because mine definitely folded up. Steve, there, <laughs> there were hundreds of them. Right, all oh, yeah. right. Oh, I didn't realise that. I've just thought TV <laughs> was real. Yeah, and then, um, and, then he saw, and then he saw the tide coming in and rang the police and said, someone's stolen my car and put yeah, it on the Yeah, that, that, that was slightly embarrassing. Yeah, actually, the people that disliked that more than anything was the fact that I put my three mechanics in the back of the car, so it went off like the Dukes of Hazard off the cliff edge, sort of, <laughs> right. and as it landed. But yes, it did. Bend. But I didn't initially have to, uh, you're right, I had to go to the police station to pick it up. And uh, I went into the police station in Daytona Beach and I said, uh, excuse me, I seem to have lost my car. Yes, sir, where did you, yes, sir, where did you leave it? I said, well, I left it on the beach last night. I had no idea that it was a restriction after the hours of darkness that you yes, couldn't right. be on the beach. So this policeman said, well, sir, he said, if you'd have gone on the right entrance, you'd have seen the sign, because he clearly knew that all that happened is the wheels had landed in the middle of the beach and there'd been no driving towards it, because we just <laughs> took off and landed there. So I had to pick it up from the police station. We had to use that car for the whole week, and my, me my mechanics and my riders were not really impressed because they had to get in and out through the windows because the doors <laughs> wouldn't open because it had bent in the middle. But anyway, but that was probably the start of it all, um, Charlie. But there was a number of occasions where we did have some issues, and we were sort of at times victim of circumstances, I would say, yeah. in that we often got late getting to the track, so we had to take some short cuts, and, and Susie at times, her lipstick went in Spain. When she was trying to put her makeup on the way to the track, it all went a bit wrong, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, well, you fired her into the ceiling of the car, into the roof of the car about three times across the course of it. That was uh, Laguna Seca. Laguna Seca, yeah. We were, tr we were by then under, a, under threat of actually being fired by the BBC for destroying too many render cars. In fact, Steve destroyed a car so badly, which I'm sure you'll get to, in one of our earlier rounds at Lausitz Ring when it was World Superbikes. That's why he came to move to the Isle of Man. <laughs> he received a bill from Europe Car for 8,900 euros. Yeah, that was the biggest bill I ever got. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. good. I didn't pay for it, actually. I we, had, we had a Renault Scenic. You remember those people movers? Well, he thought it was a Renault Megane, as in rally car. And he thought, this will be fine. They rally these things. It's great. Mm. So we, we made ourselves a rally course on the way back from Lausitz Ring, all covered in mud and all the rest of it. It was, it was appalling. It was just, but the, you were very good at it. We were doing time stuff. Well, I, I was kind of racing. I was racing trucks with Stig Blomquist at the time, so I used kind of was mixing with him at the same time, and he was telling me what you have to do and overcrest thirty, and you actually failed to say overcrest. But what hap what happened was <laughs> what happened was we had one way of going home. Then on the last day 
on the second last day, we'd come into town. He had, abs had an absolute tank slapper in this thing, hit a curb, and the very high quality um, alloy that they made the rear wheels with, it just snapped a piece off, a bit like breaking a bit off chocolate, you know, it was just this junk metal they made. So he thought, I know, we'll do the rally course on the way to the airport and get some mud on it so they won't notice. Top plan, <laughs> top plan. So we're doing the course the other way. It's fine until we get to what had been a reasonably benign dip that way, which was a vertical that way. He hit it and it's taken off. Another Dukes of Hazard. And we were really going to be in a bad place. And as the car landed, he knew what was going to happen. As the car landed, he said, my baby's wounded. <laughs> my baby's wounded. And the whole front end of it had peeled like that. We were running about 12 degrees neg on the front. It looked really good. <laughs> and it was up at the back. <laughs> but then the oil light came on, comes on. So I stick my head well, out. And I actually, stick. every light came on. Yeah, but the, the, <laughs> the, the, the sump is split like that. And we're really near the racetrack, and he thinks, I've got a great idea, we'll dump it back at the racetrack and clean it Actually, up. I and think... he said, don't worry, I used to race two strokes, I'll catch her before she nips. So, <laughs> so, so he's driving with his foot on, he didn't catch it before it nipped. Mm. Well, we got there, but actually what was so embarrassing, and it's just reminded me of this, we had agreed to give Colin Edwards and his lovely wife, Alicia, a lift back to the airport that day, hadn't yep. we? Um, because they were catching a connecting flight from Frankfurt, wherever we were going to, back to the United States of America. So uh, it was all timed. We'd pick them up at 8.30 and this and I think it was about 8.37 that we kind of coasted in, parked next to Collins Motorhome. Uh, and because we were seven minutes late and the time to get to the flight was going to be quite tight, Colin was already lifting the boot, wasn't he, putting his bags in. Yeah, well, I had car. to break it to him that we weren't going anywhere in this car because it was still kind of tinking and clicking as things do when they've got overheated. But and what was, was, was the seals going? That was right after the other, coming, <laughs> going was, down the exhaust system. And, and the trail of oil coming in. So we had a bit of a sort of embarrassing situation because Colin Edwards is a kind of, he's the rider, he's a hero of ours, and we've got yeah. this gig of giving him a lift to the airport. So uh, anyway, we had to break it to him that we weren't going to get there. So at that point, the only answer to this was I had to make the horrible phone call to our producer who I think was Mark Wilkin at the time, yeah. BBC producer, who was an award-winning producer. I had to phone him to say, could he swing by the racetrack to pick ourselves up and Colin Edwards? Because unfortunately, our car had broken down. <laughs> and then he rings, uh, which, which band company was that? Uh, it, that, that was, was Europe Car. It was Europe car. Yeah. So he rings Europe Car and says, I'm a very responsible driver. I, a warning light's come on. I don't want to take any chances. And Colin Edwards gets a great idea. We'll, we'll wash it, make it look good. Yeah. So it looked really good. There wasn't a mark on it on the surface. Mm. And it was sat like that, about 45 degrees. <laughs> looked like a top fueler, ready to go. And um, that was the last we saw of it. As we left the airport, this gentleman, I dropped the keys and he said, thank you, sir. He said, you wouldn't believe how many people leave cars that are all wrecked and everything else and <laughs> <laughs> drive them without oil in and things like that. And he said, thank you so much indeed. I said, you'll possibly get in a voucher or something like that for your good behaviour. <laughs> Well, you well, did I get, did get that voucher. It was 13,750 euros, <laughs> yeah. which is the best. But you had to write, a, well, I wrote a letter and you had to sign it in the end. That was the way we got out of it. I said, well, actually, we were driving down the road and there was a brick or something fell off of a lorry and it must have caught the sump. Yeah. I'm not sure. About 700 times. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if I actually did believe that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, yeah, we did have a few issues with hire cars over the years. And my favourite, I have to say, in fairness, was Malaysia. Rushing to the airport with, uh, um, with, with the stump. And this I, is I, another I, car fluids yeah. issue. I'd forgotten that. Well, we'd got... Um, it was a... I was trying to get a whatever make, was it? I don't know. Whatever, oh, a, Kia or something. Oh, yeah. What do they call it? A Wirra. Wirra. A Wirra or a Waja, one of those. A Wirra or... I don't know. It's made a in remade Malaysia. Remade Mitsubishis. So, and, and the reason I'm in a rush is because you were on a connecting flight to go... Back to, I was going back to Sydney. Yeah, right, OK. And we had to get there. The race had been delayed for some reason, I think rain, and we're in a real rush to get back. And I don't know if many of you have been to Kuala Lumpur Airport, but it's gridlocked usually after yeah. a race meeting. They do get a lot of people at, at the racetrack. So the only choice for me to get Charlie to the airport was to bypass most of the traffic. And there was three... Which means bypassing the road. Yeah, well, there were three or four lanes on the road and the only kind of way of getting there was on the grass. 
So we took to the grass at some speed, actually, I must say. We were getting on quite nicely. Yeah, fair. And, and we were getting along so well that there was a whole bunch of scooters and they, they're all kind of riding these moped things in Malaysia. And what always makes me giggle is that they, that it's not that cold, but they put their jackets on backwards, don't they? That's right. They turn their jackets around so that they, they've got no wind going in the front and everything else like that. So by now, we're getting along the grass. And we're not really fast, but we're probably doing, I don't know, 60, 70 k's or something like that, bombing past this traffic. And it was just a completely flat piece of grass, which made sense. Raining, by the way. Yeah, it was raining. <laughs> For the avoidance of doubt, it was raining. And we've now got five or six scooters behind us following us down this piece of grass. But complete... Well, I think you spotted it at the last minute, didn't you? Too, yeah, too late. Too there, late. There, was too a, late. there had been a sign there, and they'd sawn it off. And the, about that much pole was sticking out of the ground. Yeah. It sat really well in concrete. I mean, a wonderful, wonderful piece of construction. Yeah. It Un didn't uh, move a muscle. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, we actually did manage to get over it. But yeah, but the fuel tank did. Yeah, what didn't get over it, the front axle did and everything. I yeah, think it was it good. We kind of went over it. But all of a sudden, we kind of got this bit of a scraping noise. And immediately, the fuel gauge did that. <laughs> We'd taken a piece about that big straight through the middle of the fuel tank at the back, which I sort of spotted quite quickly as the fuel light came on and the thing went down. But what I, when I, you sensitive. I sensed it fairly early on because five scooters following us all went down. Because <laughs> yeah. there was fuel all over the grass. So these poor little lads riding along with the jackets <laughs> on backwards <laughs> just lost the front of her. So she coasted to a hole, didn't she? And luckily we got out thinking, God, we're going to miss this flight. As we got out, there was a witness in the traffic jam that watched everything that went on. So I think they saw the BBC jackets and everything else. Gave us a lift they were the fans. Airport. They were fans, yeah. yeah. Gave us a lift to the airport, <laughs> dropped the key in once more, and I can't remember what our company was, and I just said, uh, unfortunately, she's run out of fuel. And <laughs> Which actually wasn't it's lying. True. It wasn't lying. And I actually did pay. You didn't contribute, but I did pay for that. I got the bill, and it was yeah. something like about 37 quid for a new fuel tank in Malaysia. <laughs> and I was happy to pay it. So, actually, it's £17.80 you owe me. Yeah, got it. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Get, and I made the flight. I'll get that off you. So, you can see that we've had a kind of a bit of a love affair over the years. This was our... Um, I guess how uh, quite young there, I guess. Charlie, Thank God we've looked after ourselves. Yeah, uh, we have looked after ourselves quite well, haven't we? You know, you can see that, oh, that we haven't really aged over the years. Oh. What what was happening there, Charlie? I don't know. Meeting up with you to go to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. But haven't moved on. What was happening here? Having a little snooze. I was resting. Resting. Right. Okay. Gathering in, my thoughts. In in preparation. Yeah. Um, for there you go. Now. I've always been rather annoyed about this. This is the end of our kind of BBC contract. It ran out, I think it was 2014 or 15, I can't remember, 14. Which 13, it says on my pass. That would be 13 then. Yeah. Um, and you got that award, didn't you? Yeah, but they, they, yes, they obviously thought you were going to keep bothering me. Die. Um, <laughs> that was your award from uh, Erta to say thank you very much for your services over please the Please don't come back. Yeah, clear. <laughs> Clearly, they weren't keen on my services and thought I'd come back. Um, and there we are. In, so why two glasses out of interest? Uh, well, one broke. No, I just, I, it depends on what I wanted to read. Whether I want to admire you or actually read something. Okay, okay, fine, all right. All right. Uh, that's you got hold of my wife. Uh, yeah. That is my second wife, actually. Uh, first wife, I put the video on backwards and watch her get in the car and piss off. That's so that's all. <laughs> There's yeah, a little video here, I think, Jerry of our little mate, Matt Roberts. There he is, arriving on the grid now. And Jeremy Burgess alongside him for the final time. JB with 13 Premier Class titles to his name. The first one as a mechanic for Freddie Spencer back in 1985. Five as a crew chief for Mick Doohan. Seven with Valentino Rossi. And we've had the pleasure of enjoying so many of those successes over the past decade. favourite memories. Barcelona, Rossi, Lorenzo. Rossi tries to go around the outside. Can he do it? Can he cut back? Lorenzo oh. slams the door shut. Man, oh man, have we got a race. Never seen anything like it. Never seen anything like that. These guys aren't racing on a racetrack. They're racing on a tightrope. It had to be on Jorge Lorenzo's teammate in a year where they had such strong rivalry. Oh, yeah. Rossi's through now on the inside. He's done it. He's done it right on the 
And what happened in that final corner was something we've never seen before, and maybe never will again. Are there any questions? I never ever get sick of saying that. It's just a MotoGP. We didn't do anything stupid. Nolan Harley doesn't even cover it. Wallace and Gromit. Yeah, they are like an old couple, those two. I think the sidecar really epitomises our relationship. <laughs> you being a lunatic and me having a thoroughly rubbish time. We've had a few silly ideas, not all of them mine. Trust me, it will be fine. Trust me, I've heard you say that before. We were only supposed to do two laps. Third is coming up now, and this is the last one, and I've got to be careful I don't hit my out this one. But Steve, being Steve, kept going for an extra lap, and I was hanging on. I mean, really hanging on. <laughs> Jerez, 2005, Gibbonau, Rossi, last corner, bang. Side by side, Rossi now forcing his way down the inside. Gibbonau force wide. Gibbonau now fighting back. They're banging fairings as that place. Rossi trying to fight back again. The tire. Oh, ah, oh, look at that. Just, um, Charlie, just so I know that was kind of one of your favourite pictures, so. Yeah. I did bring my teeth along. Oh, bless. <laughs> Tonight, just so, yeah, good just so you feel at home. Good. I'm feeling better about myself. Yeah, you are very much so. But it was, it was good times, and, and truthfully, we used to moan and bitch about lots of things, but we had some great times there. Uh, we saw some amazing racing, um, and, and quite honestly, I think that you'd been a car guy, but you ended up a bike guy. Oh, the bikes very were much so. Sure. The hardest thing about the bikes was getting the hang of looking in a pit garage and it only had a motorbike in it. It looked all wrong. You expect to see great big race cars in there. Yeah. And there's just a bike. Yeah, the bikes... The bikes were extraordinary racing. That, that copybook stuff between Jib and Al and Rossi mm. way back early on mm. in the whole thing. Mm. And, but then, it, and then Lorenzo. I mean, what a great team when you actually have a wall in the middle of the pit garage because Rossi yeah. and Lorenzo can't get on. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. Still goes on a little bit now. But it, I think, truthfully, most of the fun was had getting in, to and from the circuits. Plummet Airways, of course. Which you became, Charlie became the only and still is the only platinum card holder of Plummet Airways, which yeah. is my little airline. The surviving platinum card. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure, of it, course. One or two had If If there. you go to Steve's house, there are a few things I can betray about Steve's house. I've just remembered these things. I don't know if you've still got it because I haven't been there for a year or so. But on the front of the house is a gentleman's urinal, which, which next to the pig. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is fantastic. You go around the back and plummet airways. The, mo the motto is, it's on my car, the fastest way to heaven? Fastest way to heaven, yeah. Yep. Plum plummet airways. There's inter there are international departures out the, b out the back, which is over his back fence on the grass strip. And there's gate one, gate two. The full body search is a mongrel, I can tell oh. you. I'm not going <laughs> to... It's just... You, you were lucky. Point. It's only normally for young ladies. Um, Actually, my, I don't know if you saw, uh, this, we've upgraded a little bit now, and we've moved things on the departure lounge now, but we do have one of those scanner things now, those, like, looks like a tennis racket type thing, but it's actually one of them fly swatting machines. <laughs> but we still scan people, and if we don't like them, you hit the button and give them an electric shock, and that's the <laughs> sort of way that goes. Poor old Matt Roberts, he unfortunately got the uh, mealworms, didn't he? I think, oh, chocolate-coated, delicious. Chocolate-coated mealworms. But Char Charlie didn't really want to... We did want to get involved, but he didn't want to be part of it. So we used to have to tip Charlie that don't eat the food, do not eat the catering. Um, and, and Matt Roberts went all the way from Plummet Airways' hub at Top Farm to Le Mans and then ate a whole box of chocolate-covered mealworms and would really enjoy them. It was them. fine, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> really, really. I don't Regular know. as clockwork. <laughs> he was just terrific. What, what, I mean, I don't know where I bought them from, but what would normally eat mealworms? I don't really know, actually. Fish. Fish, is it? Okay. Probably. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Steve used to go to extraordinary trouble with all of this stuff. Um, he, he, I don't know if you're going to tell the story, but he, he would spend hours remaking a Ferrero Rocher. I'm talking about surgically cutting it and dissecting it. He'd open a condom, put it in, reseal the entire Ferrero Rocher. It was a perfect job. It was a proper, proper forgery. And then he'd have people round to a dinner party or things like that and offer them around. <laughs> I'm not, that I'm not actually kidding. wasn't one of the stories I was going to tell tonight. <laughs> 
Well, there was also the time, uh, there was also the time our dear mate, the course commentator. Oh, yes, uh, Fred Clark. And Fred's up there in the commentary box. And those guys, I don't know how they do it. They get up there, whether it's cars or bikes, and they're in there on it all day long with every bit of background, every spanner twirler, every piece of detail you can ever imagine, which means they haven't even got time to go to the loo, much less check anything that's given them. So Steve comes in and says to, says to Fred and his assistant, uh, Baldrick, he says, this is, this is from a fan for Fred. And it was a, a beautiful, lovely box prepared Easter egg into which Steve had inserted a stead stoat. For <laughs> <laughs> which was, which I obviously wasn't going to be eaten, but it was, it was Fred's discovery mid-race as he was deciding to, to have a bit of his Easter egg. Mm. And then, of course, he knew straight away mm. who, who the giver was. Mm. Steve's reputation precedes him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and now, unfortunately, whenever I do any event that Fred's commentating on, I seem to be invisible. Mm. <laughs> Seems to refuse to talk about, which is rather strange, isn't it? Funny, though. I mean, yeah. I went to a lot of trouble to get that dead stoat. Um, <laughs> yeah, quite extraordinary. Um, but we finished up that last clip was Valencia, um, where we also had a few issues, and, and I have to say, I'm quite lucky to be here. That was where I nearly got stabbed. Uh, th this was actually one of our very, very first races together. Mm. And Steve was renowned for his asinine practical jokes, always getting us into trouble. And he wouldn't travel, not only does he have the teeth, he would travel, wouldn't go anywhere without his mouse. And he'd have a mouse on a retractable string, looked like a real mouse. And he'd chuck it out, bang, and it'd leap back across the table. And terrified people, it worked up a storm, used to get him in and out of the lounges and things like that, because, oh, the man's got a mouse, dear me, this is terrible. So we're in the restaurant. And we, it, Susie Perry and I renamed it the Stabbing Restaurant. Mm. Because Stavros gets up and he goes to the loo. And as he walks past two people having a romantic dinner, who wouldn't? He throws the mouse on the table, hits the button, and it comes back. Now, that's just the way Steve moves around a crowded room. That was, that was fine. Except the cup, I think, at the moment he threw the mouse, the guy was about to propose marriage to the woman, who, of course, <laughs> screamed hit the ceiling, and that was the end of it. So the guy decides he's going to kill Steve, which is fair, you know, <laughs> fair enough. It's early on. I mean, there's lots of guys wanted to do the job. And, but we couldn't see him. All we could see was Steve holding up a chair, fending this guy off next to a pillar. And we, I'm saying to him, and to Roger, I said, this is, look at this. He goes to no end of trouble to make this funny, doesn't he? On the other side of the pillar was a guy with a knife trying to kill him with a bread knife. And the police were caught. I think we got a free meal out of that yeah. as well. Uh, yeah. And that was just your average average. Yeah. Out. Well, I went to the toilet thinking I, I'd probably upset him. I thought I'd go away for a little bit, let him calm down. And then I did put my teeth in, sort of disguise myself as I came back. And he, <laughs> and he leapt at me with his safe knife. And I have to say... One of the funniest things that Susie Perry has ever said, because I'm there fending him off, yeah. and I was then from that night on called Chairman Mouse. <laughs> and I'm trying, trying to fend the guy off. But it, quite, it really was quite serious, and the poor bloke who was, I think, trying to propose to his lovely well, girlfriend yeah, at the time was thrown out of the restaurant for trying yeah. to stab someone, so he should. Yeah. So it was tricky times. I mean, it wasn't safe. It was dangerous times that we led, actually, wasn't it? All the, all the yeah, well, we had a producer who... Uh, who, whose job really was not to like us and not to like the way we treated rented property mm. on the BBC's tab. And we'd been given a formal warning and we were in Laguna Seca. And that we were basically on last warnings. Any more of this, any, any repeat, you're out. We had fish of the letters, haven't we? Yep. And we got, they gave us one of those enormous great turds of a thing, a Chevy Suburban or something. And we came into the, we came into the hotel and I think I was right, and I, ga I gave the, one of the producing guys in front a love tap, you know, just to say hi, just a little nerf in the back, nothing serious. Went off his head, mm. and he pulls into the driveway, and as we pull in alongside him, Gary Nixon, the late, very great Gary Nixon, was sat in the car with us. He opens the door just as this guy gets out to try to hit us, and nearly snaps the door off. We're busily trying to pull the door back on. It's hung down there about 45 degrees as we see down the stairs coming this producer. 
And we're, it was like a sitcom, trying to be really cool in front of her, and it's no, gonna, not going to be a problem. Hi, how are you? And the door's hanging down like that. Look like half a gull wing, you know. Anyway, on the, on the next day, we go back and we're leaving, and the traffic out of Laguna is also always Grid terrible. Yeah. You can't get out. So one guy's come up, and you're going through this really rough national park. Big this pickup, wasn't he? Massive monster truck. He's taken off to... He's just gone bush through all this scrub and all the rest of it because th th there's a parallel road, I don't know, half a mile away down the hill that looks clear. He thinks, I'm up for that. Let's go. So off we tear in our Chevy Suburban. Not a chance. Pezza is in the, as we used to lovingly call her, Pezza is in the back seat. She hasn't got her seatbelt on. He's hit a stump so hard, it's bent the whole front suspension in. Pezza, it's just launched past me. Break, breaks her flight by hitting a forehead just above the rear vision mirror, and she's concussed. And the car is now suspended on this log, and we know full well that about 500 yards behind us, coming up the hill, is the very same producer. I think, actually, we managed to kind of put some water on Pezza and kind of get her sorted out, put and her outside to get her to stop a car to tow right. us off. And we did get towed off, but unfortunately this car was properly bent. It was written off, really, because the whole axle was caved in. And I had to... You went off the next day. I had to take this car all the way back to uh, San Francisco yep. with the producer. And I had to drive that car all the way from Laguna Beach or Laguna Seca to San Francisco, which is a two-hour drive, with it crabbing like you cannot believe. And, and I'm trying to... Dis disguise the fact that the steering wheel's here and the wheels are going that way. And for some reason, I've got the radio on really loud because it's going... <laughs> tire squealing. Uh, and it does make me laugh, actually, because we pulled into the car park. I think it was an Avi Avis car. Parked it up. And she goes, finally, we've got a car back in one piece. <laughs> And I think you will remember that because we, we actually went and robbed some number plates overnight, didn't we? Or some bumpers and bits and pieces. Bits, yeah. bits and pieces. So she says, "Fine, we've got a car back." This and I said, "Yes, we've been we've turned responsible people." This and the other. Anyway, month no, much less than that. Seven days later, an invoice comes in from Avis for this written off car with the front axle all bent and everything yep. else. Now what have you done? She gets on the phone to me. You have ruined another car. I said, Belinda. If you remember the last words you said to me, finally, we've got a car back in one piece. She said, you're right, they're trying to con us. So she, <laughs> <laughs> so she denied it. <laughs> she believed you. She believed right. actually everything. She had no idea what trouble I went to to get the car back. Anyway, but fortunately, over the years, eventually, we did get slightly more responsible and we started to taking things a lot more seriously. Um, and there was just a little clip a minute ago of you on a sidecar, oh. which I thought you probably have a future in. And I think we've got another little clip here, quite possibly. Oh, look at that. Uh, it was a masterclass. Reading. Scott Redding, congratulations. Well done. We're going to have more of that in MotoGP Extra. Uh, but be before that, we always give you a lap of the track. Uh, we thought we'd do it a little bit differently this weekend. Here it comes. This has got to be the most stupid idea we've ever had. As far as I'm concerned, it's the absolute best. This is going to be a lap of Donington with a difference. So, how busy is it going to be into this one, into Redgate, the first corner on the circuit? They're going to be screaming for James Toesland. They saw sure our mate. And it's such a busy corner, as you know, because it tightens up a little bit. You can really get hung out here, even on the bike. This has been my line normally. Try and get the apex just there. It's a second or third gear corner, and this old girl is about fit. Trainer curve, this is one of the scariest corners anywhere in the world. It drops down the hill here. Kind of opposite camp and negative, isn't it? I'm not looking forward to the left. You might have to lean a bit when we go through this one. I don't know about you, but I have crashed around here so many times. It's bad enough in a car on a bike with this high speed direction change. Stavros! Oh. I'm trying to get my knee out here. I'm trying to keep my eyes shut. It's not good. This old hairpin, Steve, is so important, isn't it? It's not one of the usual places, but you can pass here if you get a good run out of trainers up the inside here. And then it's a real big horsepower part out of here. Right, head under the screen. Fastest part of the circuit. Oh, I'm scared. We've now got the heady heights of 45 miles an hour. What are they doing? About 170? Oh, I think, yeah, about 170 down here with a big break. You might need this for the bottom one. 
You do know what you're doing, don't you? Brace yourself! Must we? Oh! You maniac! <laughs> We're into the braking zone! It's a really, really big pull up here. Downhill very fast. Yeah, very physical, road. very physical. And like, the guys will really know they've done this race because of those 1.4 Gs of braking force, and it's so heavy. Whoa, baby, whoa, baby. I can't see out of these goggles. Okay, we're going to get the wheel up round here. Oh, that's great news. I've got the knee out. Do you want to get wrong? Over the line. Have you got the stopwatch on? No, I brought a calendar. I think it's more appropriate. I reckon that was a good lap. It was. It was just definitely under half an hour. I'll tell you what, old buddy, there's a future in this for you. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a lap of Donington at about 40 miles an hour. Treble that, and you're going to end up with what it's like on a MotoGP bike. And as it happens, luckily for me, at the end of last season, Suzuki's let me loose on one of theirs. Hey, Stavros, aren't you going to get me out of here? There you go. Charlie, you have definitely got a future on a cycle. One oh. of the, the, again, things that you kind of remind, you had to be there really, but the producer on the day was a, a ginger haired lady called Tracy Pinder. Yep. And Charlie had turned up quite late. And I don't know, you weren't in a real good mood actually that day. And particularly when you started going up in the air, going around the corners. Mm. And when it must we came, have been something I drank. Yeah, it must have been something. We came up to the end of the thing and, and Tracy said to Charlie, I want you to look angry for this, and it was the most ridiculous statement because you were absolutely flipping furious, apoplectic with rage at the time. <laughs> kind of had to be there for that. But it was, um, yeah, it was rather a special event. Now, uh, I nearly got stabbed in Valencia. Yeah. I thought you were going to die in Phillip Island. Talk us through. Oh, that. We had, a, we had this, uh, and I don't, again, I can't remember what, every year blended into another, but we were in Phillip Island, and you would turned up coming from... Your father's house, I think. Yep. I'd turned up from England or Malaysia, I can't remember where. You'd got one higher car, I'd got another higher car, and this and that. You'd had a bit of an incident with your car, I think, trying to get over some sort of hill. I ripped the front off it, managed to tape. <clears throat> the best thing was, for reasons that obviously he's about to explain by the sounds of it, I managed to glue the whole front onto it using some screws, tie wraps, real jury, but you couldn't do more than about 80 kilometres an hour Well, the whole front end started flapping. Right, right. But he ultimately had to take it back to the rental car company and take it. So I'm in the press office and I think this was probably Friday qualifying day, might have even been Thursday, can't remember, whatever. Anyway, I get a phone call from someone in the medical centre. Um, could you come to the medical centre immediately? Charlie Cox had a heart attack. And that's the, the words I got. I'm going, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course he has this. And I'm thinking it's just some kind of wind-up. Phone goes again. Could you please come to the medical centre immediately? Charlie Cox is having a heart attack. So I go down there and sure enough, I walk in a corner. There is him on a full stretcher with pipes and bits and pieces and wires stuck out here all over the place. And, and, but it wasn't a heart attack. Explain what was it. I don't well, it was fantastic because they gave me all this morphine. I was happy as a sandboy by the time you got there. I thought you were really interesting. Oh, this is lovely. Mm. No, I, I had this terrible, terrible heartburn. Mm. Really bad, and apparently... So, Rennies would have done it? Well, I wanted, I wanted some Mylanta or some Gaviscon. That's all I was looking for. Right. Okay. And they said, oh, no, it's, it's a classic symptom of having a heart attack. I said, yeah, it's also a classic symptom of the two smokes I had, followed by two meat pies. I've got terrible heartburn. <laughs> I'm in agony. Can I just have some Gaviscon? No, we're actually going to give you an ECG. Can I have some? So, by the time this is through, I almost had had a heart attack because I was so annoyed. Anyway... All of practice was suspended because they then flew me, oh, hanging it. by a thread, flew me on the, on the air ambulance helicopter. The only one that they had for all the Grand Prix riders. That's right. So I've stopped the day. The helicopter's got to fly all the way to Melbourne. And it was just like on the movies. It lands on, it lands on the roof of this hospital. These people run out with a gurney. They throw me on. They're trundling me in. I still haven't had my Gaviscon, right? It's killing me by now. And I get in there, and I'm lying in a hospital. The guy next to me dies, because I'm in the coronary care unit, and he just snuffs it. And I'm just, three days I was in there, and they said, I don't know why you're here. Your heart's fantastic. You've got a resting rate of 52. I know, I want some Gaviscon. That was the end of it. So he had to return the render car and got into trouble for it, because I knew nothing about it, of course. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I haven't wrecked my heart car, but I've now got to take his back, and the flipping front bumpers hanged on by yeah, tie wraps. And I missed the next race. I didn't mm. have to go, which I always hated. I didn't have to go to Qatar. 
Oh, it was Turkey, well. Turkey, wasn't Wherever it? Wherever it was, I was hanging yeah, by yeah, a thread, yeah, mate. Yeah, I nearly absolutely. died. But I thought you'd gone. I thought you'd gone. The only Trust good, me. the only good thing about it all was that you had a better room at the hotel than I had, so I moved in there. So that yeah, no, yeah. Actually, the view from the hospital was beautiful. Was it yeah. right? Okay. And there's been some incidents with policemen as well involved in this oh, whole God. scenario. And I and, and and I can only think of two, but one that does still make only two. Only the two. Uh, I think it was Bruno when you had to pretend you were dying on the oh, arm. Another heart attack. Yeah. 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 We'd. We decided we were late for getting to the bar at the hotel, so we went about 12 miles on the hard shoulder going into the town of Bruno, wasn't it, Czech Republic? They take a really dim view of that. They do. And, and we're going really well down the hard shoulder, and unfortunately I saw in the fast lane suck in traffic with a police car who cl clearly clocked me flying down the inside. And this Next thing, the siren's going and everything else, and we, get, we finally get pulled over. And my last words to you were, for God's sake, get out of the car, pretend you're dying and hang over the Armco barrier. Not, yeah, not this again. <laughs> so I pretend I'm dying. That's a great plan. Susie Perry's in the back of the car nearly wetting herself. Mm. Um, <laughs> as was my then current wife. Initially, um, yeah. Yeah, so they're in the back of the car, think it's really bad. He thinks he's pulled it off, except... They say, no problem, we see police escorts straight to the hospital. <laughs> Not so we missed the bar anyway, because we ended up at the bloody hospital. <laughs> um, so I had to be seen to walk Charlie in until the police car again. We ran out, got in the car and went there. But actually, I think we still saved a bit of time. And then there was the, the, the strange uh, policeman in Japan, if you remember. We were, again, in a hurry. They take a really, really dim view of speeding. It's... A, it's it's a really, as you, any of you that have been there will know, it's a really orderly place. No one honks their horn, no one goes too fast, no one does anything naughty. Uh, Steve's the only person I've ever met that can actually make them so angry they honk their horns mm. at him. Um, we used to have a little game, didn't we, how we could upset people, yeah. He was going down this motorway. I mean, I don't think the cops could compute it. I don't know how fast we were doing, 120 miles an hour, mm. whatever this thing would do, this mm. Honda Poo, whatever it was we'd rented. And they pull him over. And this, you'll have to explain it, because it was the greatest bit of bullshitting blag I've ever seen. And it was some shonky brochure with his ugly mutt on it, on the front, for some, bo some book tour he was doing. Yeah, or... I know, it was, it was quite ridiculous. Was the, the, initially, it's the, the most angry I'd ever seen a Japanese man ever, because he pulled us over and he clearly didn't speak English, we clearly didn't speak Japan, but all he kept doing was he kept pointing at my speedo, going, Hiya! And the, like, pointing where the needle was, right, yeah. as fast as it would go. And I'm trying to pacify him best I can, and this, that, and the other. And it finally, license, license. So I'm now pop my briefcase up. And luckily, on the top of my briefcase, where I've got my passport and my driving license and everything, is a brochure. And, it, and you're right, I think it was some event I was going to. And there is a picture of me on a racing motorcycle. Yeah, in leathers. So in yeah. leathers, and straight away. So he, straight away he goes, oh. <laughs> Oh, racer. So, and he knows we're not quite near to Matagi, where we're going to race. So I'm now thinking, hmm, right. Yes, racer, racer, yeah. Oh, oh, I like racing. And then, like, his English is coming a bit better. And this and that. So I, we left there that day with him coming to the racetrack at Matagi, where I was planning to leave some passes for him, because he wrote his name down and everything else. And he spent the whole weekend looking for number six, Steve Parrish, who at that time I think was 55 years old. He was not <laughs> likely to be in the Japanese Grand Prix, and a poor little man would have been... Anyway, we didn't get busted, we didn't get any fines, we just got told to clear off and go as fast as we like. So, yeah, I was, I was pretty proud of that moment, actually. Yeah, he still goes to the Grand Prix, he's looking for me. What about the cops in Monza? I don't remember that. It was uh, one of our very early races and the traffic around Monza. I mean, the worst thing about going to motor events is it's always jammed with people. Monza, world superbikes, it's going to be epic. And if you've been there, the, the racetrack at Monza is in the middle of a park, a proper, beautiful, manicured park. Uh, we couldn't even get as far as getting near the park. The traffic was so bad. And they have these huge bicycle lanes. They're actually bicycle footpaths separated by little median strips that everyone could ride their bikes down. So Steve thinks, this is a belter, we'll just use that, it's fine. We'll do, what it, we'll do exactly as you should. When we get to a, it, we'll cross on the pedestrian crossing. We're in a Nissan 
something or other. The first, one of the early cars. Was no, wasn't first. that the car that had the reversing cam? Yeah, well, that was on the way back from Monza. Okay. Yeah, so we're there. We crossed on the pedestrian crossing like good people would, but we were driving. That was all okay. We get to the edge of the park. The traffic's still a nightmare. Steve thinks, I know. We'll, take, we'll go through the park. And I mean through the park, not on roads in the park, but through the park, on the grass. There were families laying with their mats and stuff laid out, playing shuttlecock and football, and we're driving through the park. It's like a scene out of The Sound of Music, you know, this car gambling through the park. We get to the other end, and the cops look at him. It's physically impossible to have got there unless you drove across the grass for a really long way. I'm talking about more than half a mile, past the pond and everything else. They looked at him. The, woman, the police officer thought, I, 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 there's no form for this. Just go. Because they couldn't explain how we got on the other side of the human turnstile. But Stavros was absolutely mesmerised by the reversing camera. So coming home that night, he said, I'll bet, we can, because the traffic's pretty heavy, we won't get that fast. I'll bet I can get all the way back driving in reverse using the camera. <laughs> so he sat there driving in reverse. And this thing's absolutely on the rev limit now. Ning, 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 in reverse. It does about 28 mile an hour in reverse, actually. I think it's certain. We were flying. And it was all going fine until... Because we're going backwards and everyone else is coming our way, this woman behind us looks at us and thinks, shit, I'm facing the wrong way. So she chucks it. She thought she, she, thought she'd gone out of one way, sister. She thought she'd spun. Ah! So, so I don't know what happened to the poor woman. That was some year. It was a, it was I, I, honestly, I nearly did we. It was so funny. <laughs> it was a Toyota or something, a Venta, well, I don't know what it was, but it was the first car I'd ever had with a camera on. And it was bloody good, actually. It really yeah, it was worked very, quite well. Very and, and I'd kind of yeah. got used to it. I got some world record of reversing mm. thing, so I was quite good at it, actually. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. Have, you, have you got a camera on your... Maybe I've a go on your Not car now. later. No. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I borrow it for a little yeah. bit later on? No. That would be absolutely lovely. So, but there were some serious moments, of course, as well. Um, we got involved in uh, sad things like Simicelli accidents. Yeah, and, and, you know, the, 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 it was kind of madness, and we were very much involved with it. It was some fun and tragedy that went together. Uh, there was a lot of hard work, a lot of travelling that went on. There was a lot of flights here, there and everywhere. Uh, I got into trouble being a doctor on an aeroplane on one occasion, which I shouldn't do. Um, you thought it was quite funny at the time, I know. Yeah, that same producer nearly fired him. This actually really went for a bit. This was, it was almost, it was an air piracy incident that went about 12 hours, I think, from San Francisco all the way to London. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I hadn't done it. Um, <laughs> and I'm never going to do it again. Um, he really did. He convinced, John Hopkins was on the plane. We were in a hurry, we wanted to get back. Hoppo's on the plane. He'd hurt himself, cracked a rib, usual stuff. Uh, stupidly says to the flight attendant, can you help me up with my back? I've got a cracked rib. <laughs> Someone trying to fly with a cracked rib can't do that. So the, 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 um, the cabin service director comes down, what's going on here, trial light? You'll have to, I've spoken to the, cap, the captain, unless you've got a medical certificate, you can't fly, I'm sorry. You really can't, you have to get off the plane. Christ, they're going to have to get his bags off. I remember you going, oh, shit, I've got a meeting. I know. You started it. You said, I've got to get home. I was. It was in a really... Fr and they had to find his leathers bag and all the rest of it. So Einstein here decides, because we're in civvies by then, we didn't have our BBC nonsense on, he says, I'm a doctor. I've examined him. He's fine to fly. Thinking nothing more would come of it. Uh, but they're a little bit sus of this. Mm. So then, he's, then he follows it on, and he's getting in deeper and deeper and deeper, convincing him that whereabouts he practised. Uh, and then it got worse and worse and worse. But then we finally got off the ground. The, the BBC woman is spitting blood. I've never seen anybody so angry in my life. Just when we thought we were in the clear, apart from the forms we'd have to fill out for the BBC, and we bear in mind, we, we sound like, because we behave like the world's oldest teenagers, it was ridiculous. Then, just as we thought we were in the clear, the bloody um, cabin service director comes back with a proper medical emergency. Yeah, yeah. You're the only doctor on the plane. We need yeah. your assistance. <laughs> Hot water and blankets, Stavros. That's yeah, I know. I'm thinking, oh, Jesus Christ. I've watched Holby and... Cassidy. He was bricking. 
But luckily for me, he cut me very short. All it was is a drunk at the back of the plane. I was thinking I've got to deliver a baby. But he was your friend. Yeah, I know he was. I didn't know that. It was a drunk at the back of the plane called Manuel, and I get up the back, and it's one of the Dawn of cameramen that I've been working with that's drunk. <laughs> and uh, and he can't understand why I'm now a doctor, and last... <laughs> about eight hours ago, I was a presenter for BBC. <laughs> but he must have thought, shit, whatever I've drunk, whatever I've drunk has really got me this time. <laughs> Anyway, it all worked out, and I had to pronounce the poor man well that was drunk, and he got arrested at Heathrow, I seem to remember. That's true. Yeah. You made a break for it. That was very, very disappointing. Now, we are going to come on to some questions from the floor, and I'm sure there'll be probably a psychiatrist probably in the room that will want to, <laughs> want to come up and ha have a word with us. So, I think, Steve, you have got a microphone, I believe. I indeed. Thank you, you um, uh, Steve and Charlie. Well done, Charlie. Thank you. Just while, um, while you think about your questions, speed's a bit blah, blah. Steve has been at the Festival of Speed all weekend. I have, yeah. And uh, I think you've been quoted saying it was the best ever. What, it, it, what it, 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 yeah, the Festival of Speed, well, I, I love both events, obviously, at uh, Goodwood Revival Festival of Speed. And I've been going to the Festival of Speed now, I guess, 10 or 12 years, which is quite mm. remarkable, because Lord mm. Marshall, the Duke now, I believe he's called, uh, keeps inviting me back each year. Your Grace. <laughs> Your Grace. Grace. Sorry, okay, Your Grace. And in fact, I'm quite close to Janet. Do you know Janet, his wife? Who's a lovely, lovely lady? No. And right, well, we got quite close last year because after the uh, Friday evening dinner at the house where all the, get, all the, the VIPs get invited, I'd had one or two uh, glasses of red wine and I'm standing at the door and I guess there'd be about 500 people that have been in the house for dinner that night and I'm standing at the door and completely unbeknown to me, her ladyship is stood right beside me and I'm saying thank you for coming to everyone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> quite seriously. <coughs> rather embarrassing. But anyway, this year she came up and she said, it's been lovely coming here this year. For me. So, she, <laughs> so she clearly Good does sense But it's a great event, and I don't know how many of you get to go, but it just gets better and better each year. And the, the actual riders and drivers love it, and I personally love it because I get to see my heroes. Mick Doohan, Casey Stoner were there, Jackie Stewart, the... You know, the greats of our motorsport. And Agostini. And, Ag and Giacomo Agostini turns up there. And it's just lovely James Toseland. And there's people from the, the now times, James Hillier and people like that, mm. turning up there, John McGuinness. Yet some of the wonderful, great people from the past. Everyone gets together, has a drink. We have, to, well, I guess, the, the famous people have time for their fans because they're not under pressure. Yeah, yeah. To get to the racetrack, yeah. they're relaxed and everything else. So... It, it really is a great, great event. And I don't think you could reproduce it anywhere because no. it's such a wonderful... Worldwide. Set. Absolutely. Well, and the Americans and Japanese people walking around there just cannot believe what they're seeing. It mm. really is very, mm. very special. Testament for a fabulous organisation. Right, ladies and gentlemen, any questions for these two characters? I'll be sure. very surprised if there is. If not, we'll have to make some up. Yeah. If someone gets up and says they're from budget rent a yeah. car... Yeah, yeah. If, if there's anyone from a hire car... Uh, yes, sir. You've got to be first. Well done. Thank you. There you go. So who do you think is best, Rossi or Marquez? Oh, wow. Well, oh, 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 oh. well, if we, oh, don't want to get, if we don't want to get lynched, we better say Rossi. But um, <laughs> it, I, I have to say I've been asked so many times over the years who is the best throughout. And, it, and I personally believe it's absolutely impossible to jump through different generations. And arguably, these two that you've just mentioned are slightly different generations. You have to remember, Valentino Rossi now is 40 years old. He's been racing for the last, I guess, 29 years or something like that. I knew Valentino Rossi when he was five years old on a little pedal bike going around the paddock. And Mark Marquez is a slightly different era because he's 26 years old. So there is completely different there. At this time in moment, I'm going to say Mark Marquez, but that's, I'm not saying he was better than Rossi was in his prime, because Valentino Rossi was the best in his time. You go back an era before that, and, and you could arguably say that uh, um, Kenny Roberts, you could say Casey Stoney, you could say Eddie Lawson, you could say Giacomo Agostini, you could say Mike Hailwood. You know, every era has the best, and all you can ever be is the best in your time. And there's no question about it, Valentino Rossi has been the GOAT and he's had a wonderful, wonderful career. I am concerned that maybe that career is coming towards the end. It's a twilight period. 
Um, and I think Mark Marquez, as long as he doesn't, as long as he keeps bouncing, can go on to win lots more world championships. But I don't think I don't know what you think, Charlie. But yeah. I don't think I don't think you can transgress. Yeah. No, you, no. I, I think that's fair. The only thing I say is I think um, I think Rossi's a fairer racer than Marquez. Yeah. Uh, and I think he's a bigger global star because he, he, he oh, kind of he knows how to in, endure the friendship of all his fans and everything else around the world. I, when I came, when I started motorcycle racing, uh, I was racing off, against his dad. Yeah, racing against his dad and and the likes of Barry Sheen and everyone else like that. And people would go, well, so what do you do for a living? Well, I race motorcycles. And, oh, I don't understand that. Well, well, Grand Prix motorcycles, don't understand that. I used to say Barry Sheen. They go, oh, right, oh, okay, I understand that. Nowadays, Cal Crutchlow, if he's asked what he does for a living, people, he'll go, I'm a motor GP rider. They'll go, what's that? Valentino Rossi. He's the key to it. And, and yeah. it probably was when you got stopped for speeding. Who do you think you are? Sterling Moss. So Valentino yeah. Rossi has been that pivotal point of making motorcycle racing... Um, Famous, I guess you could say. It, it's actually made it so that a whole global audience wants to be involved in motorcycle racing because of Valentino Rossi. He's been the best ambassador I think we have possibly ever had worldwide in the whole, you know, forever. Yeah, but at the height of his powers, he, he was, he was, he was the only guy I ever. I mean, we, I knew who Valentino Rossi was, of course, but it's the only time I've ever seen anybody who was a sports star. And a rock star in terms of his appeal. I mean, he could have started a cult. Mm. It was extraordinary. Well, he has done. You look yeah. in the grandstand, it's yellow, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, you know, Schumacher, every bit of successful in his chosen life, but never loved like Rossi was. I was staggered. And this would happen all week. We'd get there for Thursday practice, and all people had somehow blamed. Everywhere was surrounded by people just trying to get a glimpse of him, trying to get a photo of him, so, a chance of an autograph, you know, mm. million to one shot. So when do you think he'll pack it in? Do you know what? I don't know. He, only he knows that. He still, the thing is, the fact that he's still doing it, he just loves what he's doing. He really enjoys it. If he didn't, he'd be gone now. Yeah. He's got more money than God um, and, and from, from merchandise. Even and, more than you? Uh, much more. Not, not obviously as much as Charlie Cox has got, but... <laughs> um, and, um, well, he and I had a similar tax misunderstanding. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they got confused, yeah, didn't they? they? So the yeah. challenge is, when he does pack it in, you know what you've got to do. Well, I, I read... You've got to get him here. I, I read, yeah, yeah, exactly. That, 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 <laughs> would, but that would be a challenge. Yeah, really. Yeah, how about that? Would be. But what I can tell you, if Valentino Rossi was sat up on this stage right now, he would be just like Mr Norman, because that is one yeah, of the things that he's so yeah, good at. Yeah, but we've learned that, haven't we, from the people that we've had here. I think that, so, yeah. You've brought that out in those people, and well, just a fantastic... Yeah, 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 and we are, you know, he, he accepts he's got his feet firmly on the ground, and like I say, he, can, he can't go anywhere without being mobbed, uh, and he's going to have that for the rest of his life. Sure There's no he question is. about it. Now, I did read recently, and I don't know how much truth or whether it was just a rumour, that he was looking into possibly having a drive in the DTM series. Oh, really? One of the things, he loves his cars, he likes yeah. rallying, he yeah. wins the Italian rally yeah. series on a regular basis. He's very, very talented at pretty much everything he tries doing. Yeah. Um, and I guess there comes a point... The big issue with motorcycle racing is the penalty is bigger than the crime. You mm. make a small mistake, you slide and down. You're off. Airbag yeah. or no airbag, you can still break your legs and arms yeah. and your neck yeah. if you're not careful. So he's got to, at some point, realise that his body will become less flexible than it was as when he gets he's older. Yeah. 21, 22. In fact, as even we we're know. finding that, aren't we? Unbelievable. <laughs> even we find that same situation. That um, I bet you could. Um, another question, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, right, here we go. There we go, sir. This wasn't going to be my original question, but mentioning Rossi, at my age, I can't do long-distance driving without an energy drink, so I've got cans of Valentino Rossi number 46 Monster in the door pocket. <laughs> right. And they work. Does it's it? Fine, yeah. What so happens when, when, you, when you did you start last calling the Yamaha a Yamaka? <laughs> <laughs> However, I put the car in for an MOT, and it passed, but the mechanics came out reverentially and said because there's three cans of VR46 in the box do you have a link to Valentino Rossi <laughs> is that right I could have uh, oh wonderful, wonderful. Anyway. I thought you were going to say they put it in the screen wash and <laughs> <laughs> 
the question or, or we're, is... We're still the oil filler, yeah. Who yeah. owns the motorcycle combination, and is it a friend of yours? Oh, yeah, the you know, yeah. some poor gentleman that turned he up was with, his, with this pristine motorcycle that was absolutely... had never been over 30 miles an hour. <laughs> Um, and I don't think he actually and I saw. Bet it was his father's before him, probably. Yeah, it quite possibly was. Um, and yeah, I think after he saw the footage, he wasn't quite so pleased. But it did very proud. And it was either a matchless or an AGS. I can't exactly remember. No, uh, I some... can't get the bloody Wallace and Gromit out of my mind now. No, 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 no neither can. I. Just one thing that I failed to talk about. Uh, did you bring the footage of the Donington in the bus? No, but most of these people I have, have seen me in a, oh, in a bus. Um, and in fact, I've got some new footage for you to see at Hampton Downs in New Zealand, where I got given a proper double-decker bus to go around. So that's the second lap record I oh, have okay. in, a, in a double-decker bus. One or two people well, you won't know that Charlie Cox was the presenter for Top Gear in Australia for a season, right? That's right. Right? Yeah. OK. And fun? I was, starting to, I was starting to sound too Australian, so I thought I'd better come back. Right, OK. But you had a lot of fun doing that, or not? Yeah, I did, except we were working as well. So, and they decided to launch this right in the middle of the motor racing season, so it was, it was very difficult. And it was done on a fraction of the budget that they had in the UK. Because you, your salary, I guess, sucked up a lot of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very hard to get a private plane to do the distance all the way to Sydney. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's awkward. Yeah. yeah, it was great fun. Right, good, all right. Well, that was something that was going on. Another question, maybe, ladies and gentlemen. There was another hand up somewhere. OK, just let me get to you. It was Yvonne wanted to know what restaurant she's going to next. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and Steve's going to turn up, if that's all right, Yvonne. He'll be yeah. at the next table. With, with a mouse on a street. Yeah. <laughs> what restaurant are you taking me to, then? Nowhere. <laughs> McDonald's. No, when, when Rossi finally packs in... I know he's got his, his Sky VR team, but what's going to happen to MotoGP? I know, this, you know, one man's not bigger than the sport, but what's going to happen to MotoGP um, when Rossi packs in? Uh, yeah, I think it's a, a very valid and good question. I mean, it's clearly not going to just disappear and people will have to transfer their, their solidarity to that man. But I would be surprised if he doesn't run a team or something yeah. like that. He's already got young riders coming through. I can't imagine he's just going to walk away from the sport. He'll be there or thereabouts and involved with it. But over the years, we could say that about lots of people. I mean, Ayrton Senna sadly was killed, but and he had a huge band of followers. It, it, sport does go on. Barry Sheen stopped, and he had an enormous band of followers in this country here and worldwide. Um, it will affect it. There's no question about it. There'll be, uh, there'll be a lot of yellow hats that people won't know what to do with and T-shirts <laughs> and everything else like that. But... I can't imagine that Valentino Rossi, because he loves this sport so much, will just walk away from it. Wouldn't it? I think it'd be quite lovely. I think we'd all agree that World Superbikes is in a bit of a, a bit of a rut at the moment. How nice would it be if uh, Yamaha turned around and said, "Right, there you go, World Superbikes," because I think he could go out there and oh, yeah. give Johnny Ray a good old run for his money, and that would really spark it up a little bit. So I don't believe he's going to walk away from the sport because he adores it, he loves it, he wouldn't be doing it if he didn't. So I'd like to think that somewhere or another he'll stay involved with it with any kind of luck. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another um, question, anyone? Oh, right, that's an easy one. Thank you. Um, so, obviously, as motorcycle fans, we've all got our favourite riders, etc. Um, you might not want to dish the dirt, and obviously, with interviews, it's difficult to tell, but who are the good guys in the paddock these days, and who are the um, a-holes? <laughs> oh, bloody hell. Um, well, we're possibly quite difficult because we're in a privileged position or we were in a privileged, privileged position. They mostly tried to be nice to us. Um, yeah, they were. Um, one or two, I guess you found harder to get involved with simply because uh, they kept themselves to themselves. Now, I have spent a weekend with a young fella called Casey Stoner this weekend, but as a, when he was riding, he was a bloody nightmare. Yeah. He didn't like journalists um, and I'm say, a lot of people have said it's hard to dislike Charlie Cox, but it's well worth the effort. Um, <laughs> but, but there's certain riders out there that kind of got in their own bubble a little bit more than others. Yeah. Well, he um, thought everyone was out to get him. Yeah, he did. He thought everyone was out to stitch him. But he's a lovely lad, and I spent a whole weekend uh, at Goodwood with him. And just a bit of information, he's not at all well. He's got some um, syndrome where he's blood issues, not right, he gets very tired very quickly and he's trying to have, uh, If you, a lot of you might remember that he had this lactose intolerance and they sorted that out and he went on and he won, he's the only guy that 
could ride the Ducati, arguably, yeah, to, ever. to win Grand Prix yeah. properly uh, and to win a world championship with it. But he's, uh, he's got this um, deficiency going on at the moment. He's seeing specialists with and everything else, so he's not, not at all well. And I was speaking to Adriana, his wife, and, yeah. he, and he gets really tired really quickly. He can't do anything around the house or mowing like the lawn, so I think I've got that. <laughs> <laughs> if I haven't got it, I'm getting it. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, genuinely, I have a really good mate, a next door neighbour. I don't know if you've met him. His name's Jimmy Carter, and he lives just down the road from me. And he has convinced his wife that he gets terrible hay fever, so she mows the lawn. <laughs> That's and very he doesn't strong. have any. He has no hay fever syndromes whatsoever. As soon as she starts mowing the lawn, he runs inside and covers himself up. <coughs> He's even bought her a push, like a normal, but not a ride-on motor, but a push one that's got a starter motor, so his wife can start the motor and mow the lawn. But anyway, going back to what you were saying. Generally, there wasn't anyone that was a problem. Valentino Rossi was a problem simply because every single person yeah. wanted to interview him. So we, we literally had to, and I don't know if it's the same with BT now, but we had twice a year, I think. We were allowed to interview him only twice a year, and you had to book it in, and it would be yep. at 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon. And it wasn't because he was being awkward, because at 3.30 he had been doing... Uh, Italian press and Spanish press and German press and so on and so on. So the more popular, the more famous you are, the harder it is to get hold of anyone. But most, I can't think of anyone that really was was really, really awkward about it, frankly. But we are in a privileged position. Yeah. But I understand that there would be issues with the general public trying to get hold of people and talking to them and passing your autograph book. And I often say, I think you have to look at it from their point of view. It's tantamount to you waiting outside your boss's office for a flipping an interview or something like that and someone saying, excuse me, would you sign this book for me? Because you're nervous and people, no matter who you are, no matter how high profile you are, no matter how calm you look, you are nervous when you're about to go out on a race bike. You have to be, you have to be focused and, and so sometimes I know that riders, Formula One drivers, whatever, upset you and the, you have to blame the worst people out there, often the press officers, aren't they? Yeah, they're, well, they they're trying to make themselves. them do it. They're pushing the riders to do it. Flip side to your question, I guess, there are some lovely people that you meet in that, and people like Nicky Hayden particularly. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the loveliest blokes yeah, you could ever uh, hope to bump into anywhere, yeah. in any circumstance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are some real gems out there and uh, that, that, that really take their time, and, and Colin Edwards and people like that, mm. that, that actually nothing to do with the racing, they're just good guys, proper good guys, and they're chilled and relaxed and everything else like that. And they loved what an idiot you were. They loved what you were going to get up to next. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm... To finish, um, each of you, your favourite Susie Perry story. <laughs> oh, dear. That got a bit of a reaction. Has anyone got their phone on record? <laughs> <laughs> What's yours, Charlie? Um, my... F oh, there, there, are, there are a few. My... My favourite was actually, it's another freaking car story, I'm sorry. But it was where we used to have the race going from that golf club we stayed in down to, uh, in Italy. Oh yeah, Mugello. And yeah, you yeah. get down the bottom of the hill in Mugello there. Another rally track. Another rally track. And Susie was in the front of that car, and I'm not kidding. She was trying to put her makeup on. He wasn't exaggerating. And she got out of the car, and she looked like Miss Piggy. Mm. Because she had, <laughs> and she'd had about three goes, and in the end, she'd stopped. And she didn't want to wear a seatbelt, because she'd just done her clothes, and they were pressed and perfect. And honestly, she looked like she'd been dragged out of a hedge mm. by the time we got there. And she wouldn't come back with him. No, she wouldn't. No, no. She used to get someone else to take her back. I think probably my favourite story, and she didn't really know much about it, but she does now because it's in my book. Uh, by the way, <laughs> I have brought one or two along if anyone did want to, but I just, just I'd slip that one in. But, yeah, yeah. Um, it was actually pre you, Charlie. It was Lee Diffie days, one year before we got involved. Yeah. I know that was one of the worst times of your life, but um, and I was down Susie, that, you know. Susie was quite early. Very technophobic, isn't she? All techno-minded she is. Right. And she would always have the latest gizmos and this and that. And she turned up with a new gizmo camera and left it on the side when she went to the toilet, I think oh, it was. Christ, yeah. And um, I took, took some pictures um, <laughs> down my trousers. <laughs> and then I turned around and took a picture of Lee Diffie, my co-presenter, so it really did. He, won, he didn't know why I was taking a picture of him because he hadn't realised what I'd done with the previous picture. And we put. She hated him all year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He left because they hated each other <laughs> so much. But the best part about the whole story was it wasn't her camera, it was her mum's. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, me and her mum got on real good. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but she really fancied that Lee Diffie. <laughs> I'm glad I asked that question now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Parrish and Charlie Cox. Thank you so much. Now, well held. Um, we, normally, we normally reserve these for motorsport legends. Yeah. <clears throat> On this occasion. But on this occasion, <laughs> I'm going to present this to Charlie because I think you've given a lot of people a lot of enormous oh, pleasure. Sure. This is a genuine bit of 1908 track. Oh. Uh, I varnished it this afternoon, so it's still a bit sticky. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve it's not going big... through my windscreen. <laughs> <laughs> but Steve will tell you his is bigger, but I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, he took a photograph of it. But, uh... <laughs> For you, sir. That's very well kind of you. All Thank right. you so much. Charlie Cox. Thank you, Thanks, Charlie. Charlie. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. And if you can't read that at the back, it does say, warning, senior moment currently in progress. And that yeah. it's been a se senior moment, I think, over the years. Um, and just very briefly, Charlie, you have now got a proper job, right? Uh, no, I've stopped doing that again. Right, OK. No, I, I, check, I checked with Mrs Cox. She... Told me to stop. Is she going to start working? Do you do say some stupid I do, yeah. Yeah. She's mind. busy spending. But thank you very much, and it's been a real, been a real treat. To, I haven't been here for a very long time. It was one of the first places I came when I, uh, when I popped over to England to start work for a year, 30 years ago. And mm. uh, it's been too long since I've been here. It's Come back and see us again. I will. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, right on, Jeff. Thank you again. Yeah. That's brilliant. Okay.